Hey everybody, it's Adam Lovell from Wrestling Done Right once again coming at you this time with a Ring of Honor final battle review and I am psyched. I have followed Ring of Honor since day one when Loki won the world championship. I have loved this company from the first day it existed and while I was annoyed and frustrated when Tony Khan bought it, I've gotten over it because they are back better than ever and if you watch this show and don't agree with me i couldn't begin to understand why let's jump into this now we're going to cover the pre-show in another video all right i want to get this main show reviewed right now while it's fresh in my memory and while i'm as excited as i can be this show kicked off with blake christian teaming with ar fox to take on drillistico and Roosh. Now, I'm a big fan of Roosh, and from what I understand about Drillistico, this was Dragon Lee? Uh, I, I could be wrong. Somebody will correct me in the comments, I'm sure. But from my understanding, I think that is the case. So we have the brothers here, Drillistico and Roosh, taking on Blake Christian and friend of mine from the Indies, A.R. Fox. He's such a great guy. Worked for Legacy Wrestling numerous times. Wrestled A.J. Styles a company I worked for called the Ultimate Wrestling Experience. Just so great to see him get a shot on a national pay-per-view for a national wrestling company. And this match started off hot. I mean, Drillistico started throwing part of his gear at Fox and Christian and just was acting like a hothead, but they didn't back down. And that was the story of this match. Christian and Fox did not back down all match long, even though Roosh and Drillistico are a couple of badasses. I'm not a huge Lucha Libre fan. Anybody who knows me knows that. But I love these guys because they've got a, they've got something special. They aren't just Lucha Libre. They are badasses, and I like watching them work very much. When Roosh got in there with Fox and started laying those chops in, started laying those chops down on his chest, I could feel it. It was like, oh, my God. What is... I just can't fathom having to bear that kind of pain. But AR Fox does, and he fights back with all of his might. He gets his kicks in. He gets his spin kicks in against Roosh. Really stands up to the big man, the former Ring of Honor world champion. AR Fox showing him, I'm not afraid of you. Roosh, of course, resorts to outside work, getting the auxiliary cables that are lying underneath the ring, choking out Blake Christian, doing anything he can to gain some kind of advantage and to intimidate somebody. Drillistico actually power bombs AR Fox onto the steel steps at one point. Uh, Roosh comes in and just stomps away at uh, Blake Christian, poses for the crowd. Now, here was the weakness of Roosh and Drillistico, and I got to point out that the best commentary team in all of wrestling today, Ian Riccoboni and Caprice Coleman, said as much. They said that Roosh and Drillistico, as good as they are, showboat too much. And that was their story here. They took time to pose, do the La Single Bernables pose, laying in the ring, you know, the idol pose, everything they could do throughout this match. And it cost them. They actually did the of like punting a football and then looking at the audience to see how far it went. It was some over-the-top showboating. AR Fox had an awesome spot here where he dove outside the ring onto his opponents three, four times in a row, just over the top, over the top. And Fox dives in such a way that it almost looks as, as if the man can pause in midair. He just and then continues on. Of course, we know that the laws of physics don't allow that, but that's just what an incredible high flyer this guy is. He makes it look like effortless and like he's in full control when he's in the air as if we are when we're walking. And so he dove and flip dived and twisted onto Roosh, onto Drillistico over and over several moves in a row until finally Drillistico, Drillistico took his turn. It's not a real easy name to say it, Drillistico. I don't even know, I guess it's Spanish for something. I don't know. But he gets his moment to moonsault over the top rope onto Fox and Christian on the ground. But Fox is not the one to be deterred. He's going to get in there and he's going to hit his stuff. He gets a 450 off the top rope onto Drillistico, nails his finishing move. I don't even remember what he calls it. I just said how I'm a friend of his. I, um, oh, low, main, low main something or other. 
but it's like a seated Spanish fly off the top rope onto Drillistico, hits a 450 splash off the top rope after Blake Christian hits this flipping DDT. I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what they call these maneuvers, but they're all over the place, hanging I don't want to say easily, but hanging right in there with two of the best Lucha daughters in the world. And whenever AR Fox hits that spinning 450 cannonball splash off the top rope onto Drillistico, he pins him one, two, three. Now there's some buzz out there in the wrestling world saying that the referee messed up. The fans even chanted, you effed up. I don't know. Look, referees are taught to count. And if there's no kick out, you continue to count. Drillistico did not kick out of that dive from Fox. He wiggled a little bit, but he did not kick out in any way, shape, or form. So his shoulders get counted to the mat. A.R. Fox and Blake Christian with a big win. Pretty much an upset. I mean, these guys are good, and they wrestle all over the world. But to come in here and beat two of the best luchadors in the world brothers that wrestle together train together travel together do everything together is a big deal now Rouge and Drillistico did not take this well and the beat down was on they hit Fox and and Christian with chairs they choked him with the with the cables Rouge stood up on the announcer's table and just raised his fist in the air defiantly um, they were not Preston Vance was on the outside laughing and joining in with their shenanigans They were not happy to lose this matchup, and at the end, it didn't look like they lost, but they did. They went down to Fox and Blake Christian. What a way to kick off final battle. By the way, the biggest draw, the biggest audience, the biggest gate that a Ring of Honor pay-per-view has ever done. So all of you naysayers acting like, you know, Ring of Honor is no big deal. What's Tony Khan going to do for Ring of Honor? He's, He's already done wonders. He's already taken it further than it's ever gone with final battle. That's what, and this is a great show, a great match to kick off the show. Congratulations to Christian and Fox, especially those guys absolutely deserved it. Second match was for the Ring of Honor Women's World Heavyweight Championship. Mercedes Martinez defending against longtime rival Athena. This match has been in the making for some time. Athena and AEW has just been murdering bitches dead. <laughs> I mean, really, she's just, she's found a new mode. She's in attack mode. She's in fury mode. And she just has torn countless women opponents down on AEW Dark and Elevation and Rampage for weeks. Until finally, Mercedes Martinez has had enough of it, stormed a ring to, to stop her from beating someone down, and the match was set up for the Ring of Honor Women's World title, and here it was. I loved this match, and let me tell you why. It was slow, it was methodical, and it looked strategic and like a fight. And you give me that kind of wrestling over the paint-by-numbers, step-by-step, Look, I don't want to go to into insider terms. I'm trying to stay away from that. I'm trying to watch Ring of Honor, AEW as a fan, not an insider, not another know-it-all smark that the world of wrestling does not need, but this is my style of match. There were fisticuffs. There were kicks. There was brutalization. There was an there was like an STF by Mercedes Martinez that looked like it was going to ram the back of Athena's heel through her forehead and pop that googly eye off. It was great. Mercedes Martinez, a longtime veteran, tough as they come, an excellent opponent for Athena, but Athena did not give up. Doubled knees to the face at one point from Athena, and Athena blocked Mercedes' suplex, that one where she sits her opponent on the top rope, climbs, grabs her around the waist, and just suplexes her backwards while she stays hooked to the top turnbuckle. Athena wasn't having it. She stopped it. And I think that might have turned the tides. I think when Mercedes Martinez realized that she couldn't hook her in that signature move of her, she began to wonder if she could beat this woman. She certainly didn't give up at that point, but I really look for the turning point in matches, and I think this was it here. Athena gave her like a gourd buster later, followed by a semi-running super kick while Mercedes was on her knees. Big shout out to Ian Riccoboni who threw the name Chris Adams out there. He said it was almost like a tribute to Chris Adams. If you don't know who Chris Adams is, that's a shame for you. We're talking about the gentleman who wrestled in world-class championship wrestling, the inventor of the super kick. 
And I have it on good authority that that man landed them sometimes legitimately. People were afraid of that move back when he did it. But Mercedes didn't give up. She hit a big package style suplex, followed immediately by one of the best brain busters I've seen in some time. She almost didn't, like she elevated her, but not way above her head in a suplex position, sort of like a side scoop and then fell down into the brain buster and it was a beautiful thing but it wasn't enough to take athena out mercedes hooks her in this like reverse scorpion death lock you know where she athena's on her chest and mercedes loops her legs around and leans forward pushes it pushes her into the mat and her legs towards the top of her head her heels it is a sort of a standing variation of the stf really what it looks like it's like where mercedes either kneels or stands with her opponent in an stf it's an impressive looking move but athena got to the ropes and got a lot more vicious after that whenever she side suplexed mercedes on the apron like she dropped down off the apron and continued the downward fall with mercedes onto the apron the hardest part of the ring right ladies and gentlemen but mercedes came back and got sort of like a tower of london a, a face forward tower of london where she had um athena in a suplex position but draped her feet over the guardrail and sort of winked at the crowd and fell straight down into a ddt like like a feet hook ddt hey i'm not excalibur i don't remember all the names of the moves but i'm telling you you could hear the wailing and the screams of athena for a minute or two after her face and her body hit that floor it was a rough move and both of them were outside the ring for a moment or two after that mercedes kept control when they came back in knocking athena down rearing back at her pulling back wrenching her neck and head back until athena bit mercedes in the arm I mean, it was an act of desperation. There's no doubt about it, but it worked. She broke the hold. She let go of it. And Athena took over from there, removing the turnbuckle pad behind the referee's back. She ripped the top turnbuckle off, having clearly a plan. She attempted to throw Mercedes Martinez into that turnbuckle, but Mercedes saw it coming, put her hands up and stopped it. And she was like, ah, I got that. But when, as soon as she turned around, Athena saw that she figured out what was happening ran in with a huge flying drop kick that caused mercedes to fall backward into the turnbuckle head first and shout out to caprice coleman for saying that's like being hit in the back of the head with a frying pan i mean just imagine that that turnbuckle cracking you in the back of your dome she was dazed she was confused it gave athena time to climb to the top turnbuckle and hit that diving cutter that i believe she calls the o-face i believe that's what the commentating team called it and that was it. That's all it took. One, two, three. New Ring of Honor Women's World Champion. Athena stands tall. The crowd's going wild. I mean, she's a bully. She's mean. She will bite, kick, scratch, and claw to get to the top. But this crowd loves her. They appreciate her style, as do I. Uh, nothing against Mercedes Martinez, who is one of the best out there, no doubt. But Athena, the new Ring of Honor world women's champion won it very close to her hometown her parents were in the audience the crowd went wild they wanted to see this they booed mercedes martinez several times even though really i feel like athena has been set up like a heel you know but the fans are behind her there's no doubt about it congratulations to athena on the big win the first championship to change hands on this card will there be more i'm pretty sure there will be stay tuned we're going on to the next match right now the next match was one I was very excited about. It saw the return of Shane Taylor to the new Ring of Honor, teaming with J.D. Griffey as Shane Taylor Enterprises. Now, I wasn't real familiar with Griffey. I know he's been on Dark or Dark Elevation. I looked into him a little bit because that's what wrestling fans who don't know somebody or something about the industry that's going to affect a show they're watching does. Just looked him up. He's definitely an MMA guy. I mean, if you saw this, well, no, duh, Adam. Well, I looked that information up before the matchup. Like I said, that's how, he, how I learned he's been on Dark and Dark Elevation. I, re I really like his style. I love MMA guys coming into wrestling and being like a hybrid. And that's what this guy is, and it works. And you put someone like this in um, Shane Taylor Enterprises, that's a pretty big deal and a pretty good thing for him, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Then, of course, we had the mixed emotional feelings between Shane Swerve Strickland and his partner, Keith Lee. They come out. Keith Lee offers a fist bump. Strickland's like, eh, 
and walks off. So we're already seeing dissension in the entrance. You can look at at Shane Strickland as he comes down the aisle. Now, I'm familiar with Shane. Uh, we've been friendly for years. I've worked on shows with him, me as a commentator and such. We've driven together, rode together several hours throughout Pennsylvania. And I can tell by looking at Shane Strickland, he's going to resort to his egomaniacal ways if you will he he's definitely scouted the aew landscape and has decided that he could be a star there and i don't mean just your regular everyday star appearing on the television show holding the tag team championships nothing wrong with that um, i'm talking about he thinks he could be the world champion and he's very confident about it. And you can tell just by his swagger and the way he walks to the ring. And it kicked off with Strickland versus Griffey. And you could tell Griffey had done a lot of homework here. He controlled Swerve in much of their interactions, at least at the beginning. Every time Swerve tried one of his moves, Griffey had an answer. Now, for years, especially when he was younger, Shane Strickland was a defensive wrestler. He held back and countered whenever he was attacked i sort of see that in griffey they are in no way the same wrestler that's not what i'm saying uh, but i'm seeing that defensive style out of griffey which a lot of times in mma that's what you have to do if you don't want to get your ass knocked out you can't go in there balls to the walls you have to react right and i really see him that way in uh, aew or ring of honor here and when he got in there with keith lee it was the same way it was fists up and sort of a bouncing back status of course you're going to be that way against a man three times your size or at least twice your size and so their interactions were very good now strickland and lee teamed together really well there were very few dissensions or issues or problems during the matchup i think i saw where things started to change and it's not i'm not talking an obvious moment where a uh, uh, mixed maneuver a problematic maneuver caused lee to nail strickland that was the end of their tag team i believe the problem first happened whenever shane taylor managed to land a gigantic leg drop on shane strickland on the apron i get the feeling swerve felt that keith lee either should have rescued him from that or came in there and busted something up so he had more time to recover from such a vicious maneuver. Now, shortly after that, it was the first time we would see Keith Lee versus Shane Strickland in the ring, or Keith Lee versus um, Shane Taylor in the ring. Too many Shanes. And the fans went crazy. The fans popped big for this. They wanted to see the Pretty Boy Killers, and what a hell of a name that is, isn't it? The Pretty Boy Killers against each other, and that's what they got. So Strickland did get his rest there after getting that huge leg drop, but I still think that's when the problem in his mind started to occur, at least in this matchup. Now, Taylor and Lee against each other was everything you wanted it to be. It was fisticuffs. It was two big, huge men going at it. Bull of the woods, if you will, trying to see who's going to be the bull of the woods in a ring of honor match, daddy. And an awesome moment occurred whenever Shane Taylor came off the second rope. I think it was the second. I don't think he went the whole way to the top. And Keith Lee caught him and looked like he was going to slam him or give him a power slam. But to his credit, Shane Taylor got out of it. And they came to blows in other ways until Griffey was tagged back in, as was Strickland. And when Strickland came running, charging at Griffey, he just gave him a big knee lift to the midsection, knocking Strickland down back and away. And Strickland tags Keith Lee back in. Uh, Keith Lee goes to town on Griffey. Griffey does get Keith Lee out of the ring, dives on him. Not a real bright move there, J.D. Griffey, no offense. Keith Lee catches him, and he's just looking at him in the face, and Griffey has the fear of God in his eyes, and you can tell it. Instantly, Griffey starts telling Keith Lee, you better not. Mom's not going to be happy. You better not. Mom's not Mom's not going to be happy. And it's like, what the hell is he talking about? Well, they have a relationship. Keith Lee knows Griffey's mother. To me, this is a subtle sign of something that I'm hoping is going to happen, because I think it would work. Keith Lee's return to the side of the other pretty boy killer, Shane Taylor. Now, Keith Lee is a big name on his own, so having him join Shane Taylor Promotions, I don't know if that'll happen or not. And that's no slam or insult to Shane Taylor Promotions. I just don't know if two big egotistical names like Taylor and Lee can survive as partners in a unit named after only one of them. 
So I, I don't know. Am I predicting that they could join forces and be called something else? I, maybe. I know Shane Taylor is very proud of Shane Taylor promotion, so I don't think that will happen. But I kind of would like to see them together because they're telling us here that Keith Lee knows Griffey and he obviously knows Shane Taylor. So there's still a relationship there and it causes Keith Lee to set Griffey down. That was problem number two with Shane Strickland. He didn't really show his reaction to that, not in a big major way. <clears throat> he just came over and kicked Griffey in the head after Taylor set him down and sort of like, what are you doing? But I, that's the second problem. He didn't, Keith Lee didn't rescue Shane Taylor enough in this match or Shane Strickland again. You Forgive me for that, guys. Um, he didn't rescue him enough in this match and that bothered him. And then whenever he set Griffey down when he could have just driven him into the apron or onto the concrete floor. Strickland had definitely had his fill by that point. Taylor, then Shane Taylor does deliver a huge um, sort of Tower of London move on Shane Strickland as he's hanging on the ropes. And J.D. Griffey comes in to try to finish the job, but Strickland recovers enough to start handling J.D. Griffey. At the end of the match, Shane Strickland definitely got some control back over Griffey, although Griffey did hit some incredible offensive maneuvers, actually sort of dropping Strickland down onto his exposed knee at one point. But Strickland always came back until he was caught in a triangle choke. I mean, this was a big problem. It looked like Strickland was going to go out here. J.D. Griffey had that sunk in tight. And Strickland, the only real reversal of that is to stand up and, and fall down onto your opponent. And Strickland wasn't doing it. It looked like he was going to go out. And Keith Lee came to the rescue, to his credit. But before he rescued Strickland from this move, he went over and laid some fists on his former partner, Shane Taylor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think I don't think Strickland was very happy with that, that Keith Lee took too long to come to his rescue, even though this time he did by coming off the ropes with a moonsault, Keith Lee with a moonsault. Now, hear me out here. I think Strickland had a problem with that. It did break the hold, but it was a very dangerous thing to do. And if you notice when Keith Lee climbed the ropes to do this, he looked backwards and just sort of shrugged like, eh, okay. So he knew there was a chance it hit his own partner, in my opinion, and didn't care. And that is another thing added to the list Shane Strickland has, his, has in his mind that his partner's doing him dirty on. Uh, all four men then came to blows in the ring until Keith Lee went to deliver a, a rolling elbow forearm smash to Shane Taylor, who ducked out of the way, and he hit Shane Strickland, his partner, knocking him loopy. And that's when Shane Strickland had enough. Shane Strickland rolls out of the ring after that, and he's out. He's going up the aisle. He's done. And this allows Shane Taylor to get Keith Lee in the welcome to the land, sort of a jumping, sitting over the shoulder pile driver finishing maneuver to any other human being on earth. And it looks like Keith Lee is done and Shane Strickland doesn't care. He's, he's slowly walking backwards up the aisle, rubbing his jaw after he had been elbowed by his own partner, looking like no way. The fans are pointing at him, telling him to get back to the ring, asking him what he's doing. But Shane Strickland has had enough. Now, this team is absolutely finished. Caprice Coleman points out on commentary, anytime your team member, your teammate abandons you, there's no coming back as a tag team after that. So that is what we're seeing here. And this allows... Keith Lee alone in the ring with Shane Taylor and J.D. Griffey. Now, Keith Lee kicked out of Welcome to the Land, by the way. Kicked out. Caprice Coleman pointed out, that's the only time I've ever seen anyone kick out of that because it probably was. And this is why I love Caprice Coleman. If you go to my Twitter, follow me at A. Lavelle. WrestlingDoneRight.com has all my links to my Twitter, my Facebook, my YouTube. Caprice Coleman's the best color guy in wrestling. He explains things as a wrestler would explain things. And he says, this is where Keith Lee's travel experiences in other companies has helped him. When you travel around the world like Keith Lee has and work for numerous companies like Keith Lee has, you learn to develop skills like that. The skills of being able to take punishment like welcome to the land and survive it. I, I just, Caprice Coleman explains things in a way that just is, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. If you listen to his commentary closely, you don't even just pay attention. 
you'll learn a whole lot of things about the psychology of professional wrestling beyond a shadow of a doubt. But Shane Taylor, J.D. Griffey, just going to town on Keith Lee until ironically, J.D. Griffey goes to throw this ridiculous, it's not a super kick, it's like this thrust kick and that's not just that's not doing it justice either it's where you throw your whole body like tilt your entire body on a 90 degree angle to where one of your hands is touching the mat and your leg pivots like a seesaw like have you ever seen a cartoon or something or some jackie chan movie where a guy's like near a board or something like that and jackie chan or whoever it's pivoting the board is pivoted like on like a seesaw and they pull that board down it smacks the guy in the chin and knocks him out that is how J.D. Griffey utilizes this kick. His leg is like the other end of a seesaw. And he just bends down, lifts that kick up, and hits his own partner. Ironic. I say that's ironic because that caused Jews problems with Strickland and Taylor. Here, these, these two Shane Taylor promotions remain a team. But unfortunately, this really knocks Taylor for a loop, allowing... Keith Lee to get his gigantic modified power slam, I don't know what he calls it, on J.D. Griffey and get the one, two, three. That's right, single-handedly in the last two minutes of the match or so, Keith Lee handles both Shane Taylor and J.D. Griffey, thanks to J.D. Griffey hitting his own partner, Shane Taylor. I just got to be fair and honest. And Keith Lee gets the big win for Swerve and our Gloria team that I positive is now over finished kaput but he wins the match for them by pinning jd griffey this was excellent the psychology in this was great we knew we all knew that swerve and keith lee were very likely headed towards kaputsville right we all knew that but the story and the way they finished that off and the way they did it here adding the touch of griffey knocking out his own partner as well shane taylor that was a beautiful little touch there showing that a good team, a solid organization can get past mistakes and mishaps. But Keith Lee, your winner here in a very solid tag team match. Really excited to see where both Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee wind up after this. I really am. I think both of them could be huge single stars. And if one of them win a title here before long or along the way of their singles career, they're instantly set up for a heat, a very heated rivalry for that title. Uh, that's another reason I like the psychology of this. It works well to establish two single stars who were world tag team champions that now want to achieve much more as singles and are headed for a confrontation when that day comes as well. Let's go on to the next match. The next match was for the Ring of Honor six-man championships. The champions, Dalton Castle and the boys would defend against Prince Nana's The Embassy. We're talking about Brian Cage, Toa Leona, and Bishop Khan. Now, I'm saying my words the way that I am because really, on paper, this is a mismatch. The boys, while a very good tag team, are just a mismatch for the absolute ridiculous size of the embassy dalton castle's no small man but he's not cut up and built like the embassy either this just looks like murder to me honestly but dalton castle's a good enough wrestler that he's going to hold his own and the boys they're a solid tag team but again this is going to be technique versus strength that's what it's going to come down to the match kicked off with dalton castle in there with bishop khan for years this guy was just known as khan i don't have a problem with him adding a second name usually i like when wrestlers do that i prefer two names instead of one except for rare exceptions like sting but dalton castle versus khan is a very good matchup i see khan as the best of the three wrestlers on his team and i'm a fan of brian cage I think Brian Cage just wastes too much time showboating. And I don't mean just posing, doing his muscle poses. I mean trying to show that he can do fancy flips and dives. He has toned that down a little bit over the years. But he needs to get in there and just wrestle like the big, huge man that he is. But it was pretty solid. When um, Cage got in there, he was in there against the boys, typically. And he was throwing them around, doing his bicep curls, an example of what I'm talking about. We all know how big and strong Brian Cage is. We get it. Now we want to see him work like a big, badass man. At least I do. And he typically does. He starts throwing guys around, but he always goes back to the showboating, to the, you know, watch what I can do kind of thing. And that sets him backwards in this, where the boys get a top rope drop kick on him and work him over pretty decently, even though he had control most of the time. 
he tags Leona in, and this guy, I, I'm very unfamiliar with him. I've seen him when he first appeared on the scene in AEW, um, teaming with, with Bishop Khan, and I'm impressed by this guy. He just shoulder tackled both the boys at the same time, and they went flying. And when they went outside the ring, Leona and Cage are out there just giving them suplexes on the cement floor, while, again, Bishop Khan and Dalton Castle went at it in the ring. And this was the story of this match, in my opinion. Bishop Khan and Dalton Castle is the match. I would like to see if this would ever turn into a singles match. Brian Cage gets in there, starts tossing the boys around again and doing his poses, of course. And I, I'm not slamming Brian Cage for doing this. If I'm built like that, I'm going to pose every chance I get as well. I'd just like to see him work a little bit differently, work a little bit more strongly, be the solid mass that he is. That's, that's just how I feel. Leona delivered a ridiculously senton bomb on one of the boys as he lay across the ring apron, which was absolutely vicious and looked like it might have killed him. Brian Cage then suplexed that boy. He, do, he does it that deadlift suplex. You all know who that is, what that is, right? Just literally picks them up a deadlift suplex. There's no assistance on it at all. Brings the boy back into the ring. Then we get Bishop Khan and Dalton Castle again going at it. And again, that's a theme of this matchup. I think they're the two best wrestlers in these six men. And if we see singles matches between these two down the road, this showed me they're going to be great. And they go at it for some time, back and forth. Dalton Castle at one point does like six suplexes in a row on all three members of the embassy twice. Really nails them, including big uh, Toa Leona. Or, his name is so close to Tia Leone. <laughs> that's terrible, I know, but it is. Um, Leona, that's why I keep just calling him by his last name. He actually gets tossed around. He gets a belly to back suplex from Dalton Castle. Then Castle does something that he's been doing for a little while, but it's fairly new. Like, I don't remember him doing this in the old Ring of Honor, but I could be mistaken. I, I could just possibly be forgetting. Where he takes each boy, winds them up, and throws them as if he were wrestling against them. And he's throwing them out of the ring. But instead, he's targeting members of the opposite team who are outside the ring. And he throws each boy into, into one of those members outside. I find that to be a fairly entertaining spot. Until Leona gets back in the ring and just starts going crazy, suplexing and throwing guys around. Dalton Castle winds back up in the ring with guess who bishop con and he nails it looks like it's going to be a, a like a spike pile driver but castle just picks him up in that position and falls down flat with him it was pretty vicious on leona but cage gets in there and delivers his sit down pile driver i don't remember what he calls it he has a special name for it and after that Khan and Leona take one of the boys and literally toss them up into the air where Cage catches them on the way down into a sit-out powerbomb for the win. And we have new six-man champions, the Embassy. Look, I like this. I, I'm, I don't hate Dalton Castle and the boys. I don't begrudge them. I think Castle's much better off in the singles division. The boys could go into the tag division maybe, but they're pretty much best served being his boys right that's it's just what they are and it's what it's what they're the most over as and i think castle needs to get back into the singles division whether it be ring of honor or aew he's pretty solidly over the embassy has been around ring of honor for years off and on there's been years where they haven't been around but nana is a great manager a great foreign manager he pulls that off wonderfully in my opinion and having these three monstrous guys do his bidding I think they could tear up the six-man division in Ring of Honor for a while, and I'm looking forward to that. From looking at my shirt, you may not be surprised to hear me say that I loved this next match a lot. But before we got to it, we had a backstage interview with the Martin Brothers top flight going over their big win over the Kingdom, and that's a little bit of a setback for the Kingdom. Not that the Martin Brothers aren't a worthy tag team that should win their matches, but the kingdom has been a mainstay, a big part of Ring of Honor for many years. And for Top Flight to come in brand new to Ring of Honor, no matter how good they are, and take down the kingdom, Mike Bennett and Matt Taven, that's a pretty big deal. So they're getting, they're being interviewed backstage about this, and quickly they're interrupted by Cool Hand and Daddy Magic. Two of the goofiest names I've ever heard. I'm, I'm, I mean, they're a great team. 2.0 is a solid team, but I don't know what's with those names. But they come out and they start telling Top Flight, basically, who do you think you are? You know, you're not 
real wrestlers, we're sports entertainers. I can't do Daddy Magic's accent. I don't know where he's from, but what kind of accent is that? And they're just mouthing off and basically daring Top Flight to do something about it. And they do. They get into a big brawl that, that spills all the way out into the entrance area down the ramp until finally they're separated but 2.0 daddy magic and cool hand make their way to the ring to bad mouth ring of honor and ring of honor fans saying if ring of honor is so great why did it die um i'll tell you why it died because it's full of flippy guys like top flight that can't wrestle we're here to show you what a real tag team is so does this mean that we're going to get daddy magic and cool hand as a tag team in ring of honor are they going to do Ring of Honor and AEW? These are questions that will only be answered once the Ring of Honor weekly TV series comes out on Honor Club. I'm going to have something more to say about that later. But clearly, it looks like they're establishing a legitimate feud between Top Flight and 2.0. And hey, I, that's worthy of Ring of Honor, even though these two goofballs want to stand there and run Ring of Honor down like they're above Ring of Honor. And look at this guy, Daddy Magic. He, what a psycho. I mean, I mean that in the best way possible. I mean, this guy is so over the top, but it works. You know, he's, he's pretty good on the mic. I do not like him on commentary. When I watch Dark or Dark Elevation, whichever one of those he's on, I forget. I'm sorry. Um, he, he's so over the top. He comes across like a Jerry Lawler wannabe, and it doesn't work on commentary at all, in my opinion. But on the mic, in promos, his psycho over the top shit does work, and they are ready to face top flight. I'm clearly figuring that means in Ring of Honor as it moves forward. So that's something to look forward to for sure. But of course, they stay at the top of the ramp waiting for the entrances. Uh, Wheeler Yuta is the one that sort of broke up the fight and ran top flight, or ran not top flight, but ran um, 2.0 off. He comes out first, looking determined, looking tough, looking gritty. Just Blackpool Combat Club has done wonders for this guy, even if you just start with his gear. And I've always been a, a Yuta uh, Wheeler fan. I mean, I have. Wheeler Yuta. Um, he did great in the Pure Tournament, even though he lost to John Gresham. He looked really good, and he's only stepped it up since then, and he comes out looking good here. Like I said, 2.0 do stay at the top of the ramp, though, and they pose with their boy Daniel Garcia as he comes out with that treasured, in my opinion, beautiful, treasured Ring of Honor Pure Championship. Now, if you guys don't know pure wrestling, you don't know wrestling. Pure wrestling was, is what wrestling is supposed to be. I'm not going to go over every one of the rules, but it was on the pay-per-view. If you watched it, they put up a list of rules. You, I know them, but why go over every single one of them? Basically, you can only use a closed fist once. You only get three rope breaks. After that, even if you're in the ropes, the match continues you don't get rope breaks after you've used three of them because you're supposed to be such a technical wrestler that you can avoid them okay you there's you can lose the title on disqualification or count out it's a very technical match that's why it's called pure wrestling and that's why i love this stuff with every beat of my heart pure 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 i love pure wrestling and now to be fair I don't think it's been presented exactly right on AEW television over the months since Tony Khan bought Ring of Honor. And I have cried out about that on my social media, which you can follow me at if you go to WrestlingDoneRight.com and see the links at the top of the page for my Facebook, for my Twitter, and for my YouTube. And here, they atoned for that mistake in a big way. They had the rope counters. Each guy gets three breaks, right? And they had under the guy's names, the three little dashes that went away when they used the rope break, that adds to the presentation of these matches. And they weren't doing that before. Here they did. Thank you, Tony Khan. Thank you, Ring of Honor. They had the timer on there. They had both guys' names on there. This is how a pure match is supposed to be presented. They showed the judges sitting at ringside. Everything was great here. And Daniel Garcia walks around calling himself a sports entertainer. And I know it's to get the gall of the fans. I know it's to rub it in the faces of Ring of Honor fans and people who hate that term. I'm not stupid. But here, he wrestled like a pro wrestler. He was terrific, as was Wheeler Yuta. Both guys just did everything a pure wrestler is supposed to do. Wheeler Yuta was forced to use all of his rope breaks within the first seven minutes of the match because Daniel Garcia used a strategy. He would put a move 
on Wheeler Yuta in the ropes purposely where the ref has to make a decision. Well, I have to do, I have to call this break. You know, I can't leave them in the ropes. So forcefully he took Daniel Garcia took away Wheeler Yuta's rope breaks within the first seven minutes. He also punished him. Uh, the commentary team, Rick Abani and Coleman pointed out that pure matches are often not contested on the floor as much as this was. But the deal with these two is they have a history. They legitimately hate each other. They're the polar opposite of one another. They want to destroy one another. So much of this was on the floor. Daniel Garcia, when he got him back in the ring, he put Wheeler Yuta in the corner, ripped off the turnbuckles, the legitimate metal turnbuckle pads, not the corner pads, the turnbuckle pads, the long skinny ones that lay over the, the actual turnbuckle. And placed Wheeler Yuta's head on them and then stood on his head until the ref countered him off. But I mean, it was doing ridiculous damage. To be honest, Wheeler Yuta did do it back to him. He did get one shot where he did that to Daniel Garcia too, who rolled out of the ring and proceeded to flip the audience off because he just doesn't respect Ring of Honor fans and quickly went back to working hard on Daniel Garcia since he had no rope breaks. Daniel Gar uh, Wheeler, he was working on Wheeler Yuta, Daniel Garcia was. Wheeler Yuta fought like a crazy man. I mean, he came back from a ridiculous curb stomp. Daniel Garcia locked Wheeler Yuta's legs in an Indian death lock, pulled both of his arm back and stomped his head down into the match. But Wheeler Yuta kept fighting, even though Daniel Garcia stood on him like a surfboard, sort of like a Jeff Cobb looking thing, although he didn't do the motion. You know, he just stood on top of him and looked out to the crowd like, I've got this without any kind of problem. But no, Wheeler Yuta did not give up. He kicked out of constant moves. He kicked, He managed to get out of that dragon slayer, that dragon sleeper that Daniel Garcia uses just by powering out. He got out of a pile driver, a very Paul Orndorfish looking pile driver, which looked amazing, kicked out of that. He managed to survive a scorpion death lock, finally getting a crippler crossface on Daniel Garcia. Daniel Garcia, to his credit, avoided using any rope breaks. I think he might have had lost one during this entire match, and that's a testament to his technical ability, staying out of the ropes. These guys slapped each other a lot, and I know some people don't like slaps. Slaps are silly, but these were hard, open-handed palm strikes. Call them that, because if you used a closed fist, both of them, I did miss this, I apologize, used their they're closed fists. You get one. And if you get a second one, you're disqualified. And if the champion is disqualified, loses the belt. They both used their closed fist early on. Just Daniel Garcia closed his fist and rammed it on the side of Wheeler Yuta's head. Wheeler Yuta recovered and gave a right hand back to Daniel Garcia. So instantly within the first two minutes of the match, closed fists were no longer an option. So as they went on here, it was slapping open-handed palm strikes throughout the match. Towards the about 75% into the match, Wheeler Yuta nailed an incredible brain buster. It was sort of a fisherman plex combo brain buster, which looked ridiculous. And Daniel Garcia got out of it. And both men laid prone in the center of the mat, having spent all of their energy grasping, gasping at air. A theme of this match for Daniel Garcia was working over the throat. Yes, the throat of Wheeler Yuta. He would just double chop him in the throat. He would do, and then he'd get a headlock on him. Then he'd get a cravat on him. He would work over his throat the entire match. Uh, Rick Abani and Caprice Coleman compared it to when the Macho Man took out Ricky the Dragon Steamboat with the ring bell all those years ago. Some of you watching this may not even be old enough to remember that. And Steamboat gasped for air, was out for weeks. And when he came up back to face Macho Man, of course, Macho Man targeted that throat. And that is what Garcia was doing here. His psychology, his ring work was all about attacking the throat, taking the air away, slowing down the athlete, the well-conditioned athlete in Wheeler, Utah. And this worked because Wheeler Yuta had to overcome air struggles. He had to overcome struggling to breathe to continue on in this matchup, but he did it. And it was an amazing feat to see. I thought Wheeler Yuta would, was going to be in trouble when he came off the ropes with a big splash and Daniel Garcia got the knees up and knocked all the wind out of him. Being that Wheeler Yuta was struggling to breathe all match long after having his throat attacked time and again, I thought having the air knocked completely out of him was going to be lights out because it would be even 
tougher to recover that air. If you've ever had the wind knocked out of you, you know what a scary feeling that is. Well, imagine if your throat has been worked over and worked on and chopped at for 11, 12 minutes and trying to grasp to get your air back like that. No, but Wheeler Yuta overcame that as well. So Daniel Garcia got him near the ropes and put in another sharpshooter. Uh, the referee's waving it off. I can't do anything. He's in the ropes, but oh well. He's used his three rope breaks. You know, you got to be a good enough technical pure wrestler to avoid something like this. So Daniel Garcia seemed to have it in the bag again. But Wheeler Yuta reached back while in that hold and grabbed Daniel Garcia around the neck under his throat him working his throat this time and yanked him under the rope himself where the ref is like, okay, maybe I got to call a rope break here because um, Daniel Garcia has rope breaks left. But before he could even do that, they spill out onto the arena floor, both laying there once again, grasping for air, having worked a 13 minute match up to this point, ridiculously well with great technical skill back in the ring. It was Wheeler Yuta's turn to hit a pile driver, on Daniel Garcia. It was that uh, tombstone style where Yuta will hook both of his ankles like in a cross position up here. Oh, I don't want to knock my microphone out. <laughs> up here and fall down into the pile driver. Daniel Garcia kicks out. Wheeler Yuta then, in his frustration, controlled frustration, resorts to a move that every member of the Blackpool Combat Club utilizes. Brian Danielson, mock John Moxley, Claudio Castagnoli, Wheeler Yuta. He gets both of Daniel Garcia's arms trapped under his legs and rains down elbow strikes over and over and over. 10, 12, 15 of these things. Caprice Coleman is yelling at the referee. He's out. He's out. He's wanting him to stop this match. Even though they don't have a lot of respect for Daniel Garcia, there's a little bit of fear, a little bit of concern that these elbows raining down on a man whose eyes has already rolled back into the back of his skull needs to be stopped. And Posey, the referee Posey, stops it and declares the winner by TKO. The first time ever, two-time Ring of Honor pure champion, Wheeler Yuta. Now, I know there's guys out there that is that aren't into Yuta. I know Jim Cornette likes to make jokes and call him Wheeler useless. Well, let me tell you something. You all couldn't be any more wrong. I am not ready to declare Wheeler Yuta the greatest wrestler in the world, but I am ready to declare him one of the greatest pure wrestlers in the world. The only man to ever hold this title twice. And do you know, look at the men who've held this title. Brian Danielson, Nigel McGuinness, John Grisham, Jay Lethal. Countless, incredible, terrific, pure, technical wrestlers. And Wheeler Yuta is the first guy to win it twice. And like him or not, Daniel Garcia is a prodigy. He is the next Brian Danielson. There is no doubt in my mind. No, he's not there yet. But I can remember the day when Brian Danielson was young and new in the world of wrestling. And now Ring of Honor fans loved him. Independent fans loved him. But whenever WWE fans or WCW fans got a look at him, they were never impressed. They said the same things they say about Daniel Garcia. Oh, he's small. He's not very big. Uh, you know, he's just a simple wrestler. You know, there's it, his mic work isn't terrific. The same exact complaints. And to be fair, Wheeler Yuta is very similar. You're looking at two guys here that are the future of pure wrestling and possibly pro wrestling, whether you like that or not. I happen to love it. I love it. Uh, he went for the Code of Honor handshake after the match. Instead, Daniel Garcia kicks not only Wheeler Yuta's hand away, but the belt out of his hand falls on the ground. As he goes to walk away, though, Daniel Garcia does pick the title up and hand it back to Wheeler Yuta. Not in any big congratulatory way, but just enough to acknowledge, yeah, you won. Here's your belt. And Wheeler Yuta celebrates proudly, holding it up in the air. Again, the only two-time pure champion. This wasn't the match of the night. I, I, as much as I love pure wrestling and I love this match, this was a terrific match. You can't call it the match of the night when you're talking about on a show that had the, this, the upcoming, I'm going to discuss, double dog collar tag team match between the Briscoes and FTR 
and the amazing Ring of Honor world title match between Chris Jericho and Claudio Castagnoli. But this was up there, top three. Of course, they were the final three matches. This was top three. On any other show, this would have stolen the show, at least for me. I love this style of wrestling. Congratulations to both guys, especially Wheeler, Utah, being the first two-time champion. I can't say that enough. That's an amazing statistic after all the years of the pure title being around. Now, it did take a hiatus, but even still. I am worked up and ready to go for the next match, the double dog collar match. Let's jump into that now. What a match. Now, I'm going to put it out here right now that I am typically not a fan of these kind of matches. I'm not a hardcore fan. I'm not a steel cage fan. I'm not a stipulation fan. Now, here's the thing, though. I understand that those things work in wrestling if done correctly and very sparingly. I would argue that AEW has already had too many dog collar matches. I believe this was the third one in their history, and they've only been around a little over three years. It's too many, in my opinion. Doesn't make them special when you're having them that often, but, but throw that typically normal way of thinking out the window this was the greatest uh, is this the greatest chain slash dog collar match i've ever seen if not it's up there i was very young when the infamous rowdy roddy piper versus greg valentine chain match happened i saw it but i think i can't remember the year on that but i was in elementary school i believe i i know it was good i also didn't have the experience with wrestling that I do now, not just watching, but having been part of the business on the independent level for a number of years. I'm telling you, the Briscoes versus FTR in a double dog collar match was off the chain. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. I mean, two of the greatest tag teams, definitely, I would say the two greatest tag teams of the modern era. And both of these guys, both of these teams have cemented themselves as possibly two of the best tag teams ever. And I don't, I reluctantly say that about anyone to put anyone in the best ever category is a ridiculous thing to do because it encompasses so much time. But before I go into it, let's just talk about the match a little bit. The Briscoes came out in these very cool black trench coats, these overcoats. Um, Ian Ricky Bonnie informed us when they go out to slaughter the sheep, that's what they wear. You know, so that was telling us something that was kind of cool and creepy at the same time. But the Briscoes, they are the realest of the real. What you see is what you get. I have spoken with these guys numerous times. I've met them numerous times. I remember watching one Briscoe match up around Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, somewhere in that area. I can't remember who they wrestled, but it was a good match. And afterward, they were, you know, slapping high fives at the crowd. I was in the front row and Jay hugged me and said, thanks for all you do, brother. I, it was just one of my favorite moments as a journalist, if you will, uh, getting credit from those guys. I, I was thanked by Delirious that same night. You know, he didn't speak, but, but gibberish. But when he came up to me, he quietly thanked me as well. I'm just throwing this out there because I missed that relationship with Ring of Honor. And well, I'm glad Tony Khan has got it and doing this with it. I'm going to miss those moments for sure. Um, out came FTR draped in gold. Of course, the AAA, the IWGP, and the Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. Now, let me tell you some bitches something. You guys out there that want to act like Ring of Honor is no big deal. Ring of Honor isn't over. Nobody cares about Ring of Honor. Kiss my ass, dickhead. Here's two teams. Four of the best wrestlers in the world today. The two best tag teams in the world today. Killing themselves. For ring of honor killing themselves in a match for the ring of honor tag team championship but it, you know who cares right who cares it's not over nobody cares about it ignorant ass dickhead fans drive me crazy they strap these chains to their necks i mean two chains four collars one guy strapped to another the other guy strapped to the other guy it just the aesthetic of it was incredible the fans on their feet just about the entire time but standing and awe as the referee puts the collars around all four men's necks and they instantly just start with a gigantic brawl. I mean, just rolling around all over the place, punching, kicking, going at it heavily. Within seconds, it seemed like Mark Briscoe was busted open. He, he's just standing there, his, his mouth agape, 
looking shocked and amazed as blood trickles down his head. We got Cash Wheeler choking Jay Briscoe around the ring post within the first couple of minutes while Dax Harwood and Jay Briscoe fight it out with their chains wrapped around their wrists and they're just battling, giving their life, giving their all giving their blood, sweat, and tears, literally. Then Jay and Mark Briscoe team up on Dax Harwood. Just pound him over and over with that chain, whip him with that chain. But FTR storms back, and before long, they have Mark Briscoe up in the Briscoe's finishing maneuver, the Doomsday Device, and Cash Wheeler jumps off with the chain wrapped around his arm and clotheslines him with it, and the son of a bitch kicks out of that. Uh, th this would be the theme of the night. You were going to have to kill these guys to keep them down. And I know you hear that all the time, but you, watching this, you literally thought this. I mean, this was the bloodiest, the ugliest, the biggest, most legitimate looking fight I have seen in wrestling in ages. Ages. I mean, people talk about other wrestlers. I don't want to name drop them. I almost did. And other companies that have great matches, and I'm, I'm not doubting that they did. But this was more than a match. This looked legit. This felt legit. You can feel the passion. Caprice Coleman talked about smelling the iron in the air from all the blood in this match. And I'm sure that you could, but I could feel the passion for wrestling seeping through my television screen from FTR and the Briscoes that just gave me goosebumps like Santa Claus did when I was a little boy. And I thought I heard a noise on the roof. I mean, it was just something to behold. Now, I'm, I'm using a lot of adjectives and stuff to describe this, but I don't know what else to do. At one point, um, Cash had Mark Briscoe, Mark Briscoe, I think, took some of the Morse punishment here, up over on his back like he was going to give him a gory bomb. And instead, he draped a chain around his neck and pulled down on it while he had him in that hole, just holding him there. He then threw him over the top rope. And of course, somebody has to get hanged, right? He's hanged over the top rope with the chain as Cash pulls back on it, just wrenching it. And what does Jay do? He throws Dax into the chain that's hanging his brother just so Cash releases the chain from that, you know, that hit, that bump to let his brother breathe again. And countless times, two or all four of these men are laying in the ring with blood pouring and soaking the mat around them. And they're laying back to back, side to side, head to head, looking at each other, looking at the ref, looking into the crowd, trying to muster the strength to stand back up and keep doing this. At one, at one point, Dax Wilder is nailing Jay Briscoe with the chain wrapped around his fist. You see this numerous times, but you don't get tired of it because it's breathtaking. Even the pretty much reserved Ian Riccoboni, who I'm not insulting him, saying that he's a great commentator, great commentator. He's so excited with this. He is so up for this. His voice is three octaves higher. It's incredible stuff. But as Dax Wilder is hamming, hammering Jay, Jay actually pulls the referee in between them to, to mercifully try to stop the beating and Posey, referee Posey, gets hammered with a chain by Dax Harwood, and he's busted open. And I mean busted open bad, blood just flowing over him, every bit as bad as it was any of the wrestlers. The second outside referee had to come in and take over. This was incredible stuff. These... Uh, I don't know what else to say about it other than this has to be seen to be believed. I cannot do it justice sitting here talking about it. Even I and, and Ian and Caprice Coleman had a rough time. Again, they were great. I, I'm not saying they weren't, but they admittedly were having a rough time keeping up with it. The, they had split screens numerous times because what were these two? What were um, Dax and Jay doing each other as they were chained together? What were Mark and Cash doing each other when they were chained together as they were separated all over the ring, just un dealing unbelievable punishment? It's Sometimes the Briscoes get um, Dax up into, looks like they're going to give him their own doomsday device, but instead Cash quickly climbs onto the apron linked to Jay by a chain who's climbing the ropes to deliver the doomsday device and pulls him down onto a stack of chairs on the outside, just pulls him from the top rope to the outside onto a stack of steel chairs that had been stacked up there earlier when one of the Briscoes were going to try to suplex or power slam one of the FTR members, I can't remember which, under these pile of chairs, but it came back to haunt the Briscoes when Jay gets tossed off the top rope by his neck onto a... Look, there's only so much 
kayfabe you can do when it comes to shit like this. This was brutal punishment. This was four guys selling out for the love of the sport. Jay hits a J driller on Dax Wilder on the chain. Like the chain's riled up, piled up, swirled up, and Jay gets that ridiculously good J driller on Dax Wilder. Bam, down he goes, and he kicks out. One of the few men in the history of Ring of Honor to kick out of the Jay Driller. The Jay Driller has won Jay Briscoe the world title, the Ring of Honor world title, the singles championship two times. He's won Jay Briscoe is one of the few wrestlers in Ring of Honor history to hold the Ring of Honor world title more than once. But he kicks out of this. He he looks like a man defeated. He looks like a man ready to be hospitalized, but he found the inner strength somehow to kick out of that move. And not only to kick out of it, but to deliver his own pile driver to Jay Briscoe moments later onto a chair and the chain, which Jay Briscoe kicked out of. Now, I'm going to admit, too, I'm normally not a fan of ridiculous false finishes over and over time and again throughout a match. I'm not. And if you want to call me a hypocrite for this match, you go right ahead. But the fighting spirit here applied like I've never seen it apply before. It's an unbelievable moments in this match of guys overcoming and continuing to go on. Why? Because these precious Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles mean something to these wrestlers and to the fans in this crowd and to this guy sitting here talking to you on camera. It means something to us. And all you little pricks out there talking about how Ring of Honor isn't over and Tony Khan wasted his money and all the nonsense I see from you clowns, you weird those you wackos you're out of your minds you're disrespecting the business you're disrespecting these four men and every day i wake up i dream of slapping you and putting you in your place you two-bit basement dwelling weirdos the match jay briscoe getting back to it wanted to end the match after he heard cash outside the ring scream into dax murder him he was picking up the stack of chairs that he earlier had pulled mark briscoe down on top of from the top rope by his neck on a chain and throwing each chair into the ring as he yelled to his partner dax murder him ian riccoboni said i'm not even going to repeat what he said there because he said fucking murder him sorry youtube that's what he said but jay briscoe motivated by that comment because who wouldn't be manages to get dax on the top rope and deliver a huge superplex from the top rope to the center of the ring on top of the very chairs that Dax, or Cash, excuse me, threw into the ring from the outside. Now, Cash realized that this was going to be a problem, knew that this could be the end of the match, and he's desperately trying to get in the ring. And while Jay Briscoe is beaten and bloodied and down and almost out, musters the strength to just hold on to a chain, like when I used to walk my former dog that sadly passed away, Hilo, an Italian Mastiff gigantic dog and that's what jay briscoe looked like he looked like me trying to control that dog just pulling all his weight on this chain just to keep cash from getting in the ring and break up this pin attempt he didn't have to break it up because once again freaking dax kicks out kicks out of a superplex from the top rope onto a stack of chairs kicks out Jay Briscoe, in his frustration, in his anger, in his desire to become a 13-time Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champion, drapes the chain around Dax's throat and mouth, into his mouth, and like a crippler crossface, kind of, but without really looking like a maneuver, he just wraps that chain around him, goes into his mouth, and he pulls back, just like Jay was pulling cash on the outside, but here... Dax is prone. He's down on his stomach and his chain's in his mouth and he's just, and blood's pouring down and it's coming out the sides of his mouth and it's coming out of his forehead. And Jay's just pulling and pulling. And Dax will not give up. He will not give up. He's not going to tap. He's not going to lose these titles. But he could only hold on for so long before the referee had to stop it because his eyes rolled back into his head and he was out. He was done. It was over. The Briscoes had regained the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championship for the 13th time. They continued just to break records, smash records, and prove why they are the best of the best. And yes, I think there's an argument to be made that while FTR have defeated the Briscoes twice and the Briscoes had defeated them once, and it took a stipulation match to do it, there's an argument to be made that the Briscoes are the greatest tag team in the world, not just because of this match, but because a 13-time Ring of Honor world tag champs hey don't scoff at that look up 
who they faced through their careers. It's an astronomically long list. Look up at the teams and the men who have gone through Ring of Honor and that the Briscoes have beaten in tag teams and in Jay's case, singles matches. They are, they've been doing it longer than FTR. They really have, especially as a tag team. And they are just, they are the realest of the real. If anybody in this world of wrestling is real, it's the Briscoes. And a friend of mine, most of you don't know, named the Red Scorpion. <laughs> He's as real as they come to, buddy. Uh, look him up. Um, these guys, these guys are it, man. And I was thrilled to see them win this. All four men lay in a pool of blood and a stack of chairs as the referee gets the tag titles, doesn't even know what to do with them. All four men are still down and out. Finally, the Briscoes rise and lift those titles into the air. But no sooner did they walk off because they didn't, they actually wanted to give the last moment to FTR. I, I really think they did. They wanted FTR to be able to thank the fans for supporting them through all this time. In come the ass boys. In comes the gun club. Billy Gunn's children. I always forget the one's names. Austin and Colton, I believe. They come in and attack the beaten down, the bloodied and the bruised FTR like a bunch of cowards. They come in like a bunch of two-bit punk asses and just jump FTR, try to beat them up a little bit, tell them how they're not afraid of them, get their blood all over them and stand up and take their shirts off because they're so cool. They're so bad ass, right? Pun intended. And when you think it couldn't get any worse, that they might beat them down even more, that they might retire these two because this match could have done that in and of itself. The Briscoes make their way back out to run off Colton and Austin, the, the gun club, get them out of the ring, but they stand at the top of the ramp and say how they're not afraid of FTR and how they're going to end their legacy, that it's already ending as they lost this championship and they're going to be the ones that that get rid of them completely and destroy their legacy and walk off finally as FTR and the Briscoes, all four, get their hand raised by the referee just because, honestly, <laughs> they are all all winners. And that sounds like some corny modern day mumbo jumbo. But in this instance, it is absolutely true. Four winners, two of the greatest tag teams in the world today, if not the two greatest, standing there with their arms raised. And then finally, the Briscoes alone get their arm raised, holding those Ring of Honor tag team titles after an incredible match that I have not done justice on this recap, on this thought, on this review of it. I just can't. You, I've watched this match four times. Four times. There aren't a whole lot of wrestling holds and maneuvers like the Pure Championship for me to sit here and talk about. There wasn't a whole lot of strategy laid out for me to sit here and talk about. This was just a brutal fight that looked legitimate as hell it looked like two teams that just wanted to kill each other just to be the ring of honor world tag team champions in front of an amazing crowd that knew what they were watching and wow this is one of my all-time favorite matches and i can't believe the purist is sitting here saying a bloody disgustingly brutal double dog collar match is one of my all-time favorite matches but it is it is. It was just so believable, so awesome, so edge of your seat, don't take your eyes off of it, professional wrestling, the way it's supposed to be, especially when you're going to do a gimmick match like this. If you're going to have four guys strapped in a dog collar, by God, it has to look legitimate. You can't fake that. You can't walk through that. You can't prepare for it like so many wrestlers do in, in a ring and I, some insider stuff again that i'm trying to stay away from but most of you know the wrestlers will walk through their matches and practice and practice them a lot of times before a show starts I, there's no way you could have done that here this was four guys that know how to call it in the ring know how to work what would typically be a very unsafe style of match safely and effectively and make the crowd believe and there's nothing nothing better than that just like there's no tag teams in wrestling better than ftr and the briscoes i don't think anybody's even close and if you doubt that after watching this i don't know what to say i don't know what the answer to you is other than okay whatever Great stuff. Match of the night. I, I'm telling you, I'm calling it. I, I love many matches on this show, including upcoming ones, because I'm obviously watching this more than once. I've already watched the show. I'm watching it again. I watch the match, and then I start recording my thoughts on it, and then stop and watch another match 
ad nauseum until I get to the end of this. And I already watched this twice before. This is my third viewing of the show, fourth viewing of this match. And I can't recommend this enough. This would have been worth the sole price of the pay-per-view, but the pay-per-view was great. It was worth the money, the entire show. But if every match would have been a dud, which it was not, this match alone would have been worth the price of admission. Seventh match of the night was for the Ring of Honor World Television Championship as the king of all television, Your Excellency, Your Highness himself. Samoa Joe defends against a challenger coming out of Japan, former IWGP United States champion, Juice Robinson. Juice Robinson wanted to come over into AEW. He signed a deal to work in AEW, even though he's still with New Japan because he's from America and he wrestles in the LA Dojo out there in New Japan Strong once in a while. So he wants to come into AEW whenever he possibly can to prove his worth and to win championships just like he's done in Japan. And he's here to challenge for this television championship. And Samoa Joe begins the match by asking him if he's sure that he knows what he's doing here. And Juice does. And he has a pretty good showing for himself. He throws Samoa Joe around a couple times, picks him up, and gives a big side suplex to the big man. But soon after doing that, Joe locks him in the choke out, the sleeper hold instantly, starts to cross his legs, but Juice Robinson wiggles, him, wiggles himself out of it and gets to the ropes. Juice would have to rely on the ropes a couple times in this matchup. They go to the floor and they battle it out with chops and headbutts of all things. Juice Robinson out to win this title, but also out to show the AEW crowd who he is. I think most of the AEW audience knows, but those new to AEW wanting to check out something other than the WWE may not know who Juice is, and he really wants to show them here. One of his best offensive maneuvers actually came outside the ring when Joe locked him in a sleeper hold outside the ring. Because you see, as um, Ian and Caprice Coleman pointed out on commentary, didn't matter if Joe put him to sleep out there. If he he wins, he wins. You know, by count out or however, he retains his title. Doesn't matter. So Juice Robinson has to do something. He has to escape out of this sleeper hold. And what he does is he puts his foot up on the ring post and pushes backward, driving Samoa Joe into the barrier. Not only into the barrier, but when he pushed, he sort of fell down and back and slammed the back of his head into that ring, that metal ringside barrier. Now, that isn't some incredible move, but it showed a very high level of intelligence on Juice Robinson's part. But unfortunately for Juice Robinson, Samoa Joe is a monster. He is a freak. He is a wild man. And when they get back into the ring and Juice Robinson charges him in a corner, so Samoa Joe just hits that STO, just picks him up and throws him down hard. And Juice Robinson's out of the ring. Samoa Joe looks over his shoulder, looks at the crowd who had just been chanting, Joe is going to kill you to Juice Robinson. And Samoa Joe gives them a quick nod, runs across the ring, leaps between the top and second rope and dives hard onto Juice Robinson. There's no reason Samoa Joe had to do anything like that. He was in control of this match, but he sacrificed himself for the crowd and to hurt Juice Robinson, which he does, because when Juice Robinson is back in the ring, he gets slammed to the canvas and gets a big running senton bomb from Samoa Joe. And I mean, he leapt higher than I have ever seen him leap before. But Juice Robinson was not done. He did fight back, delivered a modified spine buster to Joe, and followed, it up, followed that up with a running back body splash, a cannonball, if you will, onto Samoa Joe, and that hit Samoa Joe very hard. Juice Robinson then climbed to the top, and we saw a little bit of the Japanese spirit in him here as he did the high fly flow. Tanahashi's finishing maneuver. If you don't know who that is, look him up, ladies and gentlemen. Nails Joe with that leap, but that's not going to hold Joe down. It just simply isn't. Joe is up and power bombs Juice Robinson hard to the mat, locks in a cross base. First, it starts with an STF, and when Juice wiggles enough, moves around enough to sort of seem and feel like he's going to get out of the STF, Joe turns it into a cross face and Juice Robinson is ready to tap. Numerous times you can see his hand up. He's getting ready to tap out, but he holds off. He keeps from doing it. Joe then 
works him into the corner and juice robinson works his way up seat into a seated position on the turnbuckle and that's a perfect spot for joe because he gets him in the dreaded muscle buster now you can see here juice robinson trying to fight out of this he almost does it he wiggles he twists he turns he swings he does anything he can because he knows what's coming he can't escape joe locks in the mus muscle buster hits it in the middle of the ring one two three I might have say, made this sound a little one-sided, which it was not. Juice Robinson put up a hell of a fight, really showed this crowd who he was and what he was about. But Samoa Joe is in another galaxy these days. I don't know who's going to challenge this guy seriously. It's nobody that's faced him anytime soon. If Wardlow doesn't give Joe a serious challenge, Joe may hold these titles until he retires. He is the king of all television. And if you want to see something really fun, something really good. Check out the Ring of Honor Media Scrum after this. If you don't want to watch the whole thing, it's about an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. It's all pretty decent. Watch Samoa Joe's part. His interview, his antics, put it that way. And he's 100% serious. I, I call it, he's not being funny. But the way he performs, the words that he says in this media scrum was as entertaining as this match. Check that out. Um, this match was good. It was probably one of the most flat matches of the show, though. Flat doesn't mean mad. It was just pretty much even keel. Samoa Joe was never, him losing was never really, didn't really look like it was going to be possible. But this was far from a squash match. Far from it. Juice Robinson looked damn good. Just damn good isn't good enough against the king of all television, Samoa Joe. And boy, is he back. Like, he hasn't been back in, what, what it's been like 17, 18 years 17 years since he was on a final battle. 17 years. And he ruled the roost here. He went through Juice Robinson without much of a problem. And now we're ready for the main event. The main event of final battle 2022 is upon us. The Ring of Honor world champion, my boy, Chris Jericho. Now, it's not like I don't like Claudio Castagnoli and the Blackpool Combat Club, because maybe I do. But I got to respect, like Ian Riccoboni said numerous times, everything Chris Jericho did for the Ring of Honor World Championship, because he made it, baby. You can have people out there arguing about that, but they're nuts. There's no doubt about it. Chris Jericho helped elevate the Ring of Honor World title like it's never been elevated before. Claudio Castagnoli is coming in here awfully determined, though, because if he loses, he has to join the Jericho Appreciation Society. And 2.0, Daddy Mac and Daddy Magic and cool hand have already announced that when that happens if technically but they said when that happens he'll have to don a purple bucket hat and become a tag team with jake hager called hat trick yikes all they did was fuel claudio's fire if you ask me but jerry will come in looking cool he always has the cool jackets that i'm envious of golden spikes fringes looking like a million bucks even though he's also around my age i just turned 53 right now as i record this show Guys, if anybody wants to wish me a happy birthday, if you want to do something nice for me that won't cost you five cents, won't cost you one cent, subscribe to the channel. Please subscribe to the channel and ask one person you know that loves wrestling to subscribe to my channel. That would be a great birthday gift. But this match, baby, this match started off with Claudio telling Chris Jericho to do the right thing. Code of Honor handshake course jericho kicks him in the stomach instead and then pursues ian riccoboni and caprice coleman chases after them they have to get up and literally run flee the announced position because chris jericho is going to just smack them around i guess now caprice coleman made a very interesting comment on his twitter saying look he just went with the flow rather than stand his ground and, and punch chris jericho in the mouth and chris jericho responded pretty much daring him to punch him because he would destroy him and he actually dropped an af bomb in there check that out on their twitter you can check out my twitter just by going to wrestlingdoneright.com and clicking on the link there's links on my page wrestlingdoneright.com for my facebook for my twitter and for the youtube page but claudio finally catches chris jericho who was chasing the commentators and slams him all around the ringside area outside the ring into numerous barriers tosses him back into the ring climbs to the top rope and leaps off with a huge cross body onto chris jericho throws him into the opposite corner and the european uppercuts begin baby who can withstand these well chris jericho withstood him 
But, holy crap, Claudio Castagnoli gets Chris Jericho in the neutralizer within the first minute or two of this match and, and hammers him through the canvas. You can see referee Posey's shocked look on his face like, oh my God, he hit that finisher already. But Chris Jericho did kick out. He managed to kick out, and Caprice Coleman points out on commentary, yeah, he kicked out, but if you're going to be hit with a move like that at the beginning of that match, all you're going to do for the rest of the match is try to kick, scratch, and claw your way back from a move like that. To be hit with such a devastating maneuver like the neutralizer minutes into the match is not a good sign for you. And Claudio climbs the top rope with Jericho. And just has him in a gut wrench suplex, standing there looking at the crowd, holding the large man that Chris Jericho is, throwing him down, coming back down after tossing him, picking him up over his head with a gorilla press, and running and throwing him over the top rope. They call him the Swiss Superman for a reason. Claudio Castagnoli is the real deal. Now, he does get a boost of confidence from this blast of offense, which I think hurt him a little bit because later when Claudio's on the top rope and has Chris in a position to powerbomb him off of the top rope, Chris actually turns it into a hurricanrana and takes the offense for a little while. But what Chris Jericho is shocked at just moments after this, that no matter how much offense he applies to Claudio Castagnoli, it does nothing. Chris actually stops and his mouth, his jaw drops open, wondering, clearly wondering to himself, what do I have to do to stop this man? I have hit him with my offensive maneuvers. I have reversed a top rope power bomb into a hurricanrana. Nothing's holding this guy down. And both of them get so psyched out that they're doing like just growling almost. It reminded me so much of a Japanese strong style contest chopping each other, forearming each other, European uppercuts, just blow after blow after blow. And both guys get in each other's faces and just sort of hulk out, just like Ugh, growl at each other. You're not going to stop me. You're not going to stop me. And the match continues until Chris Jericho locks in the walls of Jericho. And it does not look good for Claudio Castagnoli, but his strength and his size allows him to get to the ropes and break it up. And at this point, Chris Jericho is, he's just frustrated beyond words. He has given his all. He has hit Claudio with everything that he has, and he won't go down. Claudio, much in the same way, hit the neutralizer early on in this match. And while it wore Jericho down, and if you watch Jericho in this match, you can see him breathing through his mouth. And if you know anything about athletics, you know when an athlete, no matter what sport, is breathing with their mouth open, they are tired, they are exhausted, they are worn down. And this was Chris Jericho from about the middle of this match forward, where Claudio didn't look like he was even winded during the whole thing. This was a battle. This was a war. This was a fight. But Claudio was definitely winning the battle of conditioning. No doubt about it. Chris Jericho's done a lot of things to lose the extra weight he had early in AEW and really look more like the athlete he's always been. And I admire and respect him for that. But here, Claudio outperformed him in every way in regard to conditioning. And that came into that came into purpose here as the match went on because outcome cool hand and daddy magic they have the infamous bat that chris jericho likes to use i guess he stole the idea from sting i don't know but they have the bat with them and cool hand is distracting the ref and claudio while daddy magic hands the bat to chris jericho who turns around and nails claudio hard with the bat and the crowd is moaning the crowd goes silent even uh Ian Riccoboni on commentary says, I'm not going to count along with this when the ref starts to count. This is ridiculous. It can't end this way. And here comes the ref. Posey, one, two, kick out. Claudio Castagnoli kicks out from a shot with a bat. That's how inspired. Just like I told you guys earlier with the FTR versus um, the Briscoe match. People act like Ring of Honor is no big deal. Tell it to these guys. Tell it to these athletes. Tell it to these wrestlers. Tell it to Claudio Castagnoli, who came back time and again, including from a shot with a belt. He picks Chris Jericho up around the waist, drops him down, and hooks in the giant swing. Now, he did attempt this giant swing earlier in the match, and Chris Jericho foiled it by grabbing one of his legs and rolling him up for a quick two count. Here, Chris Jericho is so taken aback by by um, Claudio Castagnoli not going down from a shot with the bat, I think he was just 
and shock. He was shock and awe, baby. Shock and awe. And he didn't know how to respond to this. He wasn't ready to reverse this one. And Claudio swings and swings and swings. More than 30 rotations of the giant swing. So much so. So wild. So crazy. So dizzying and nauseating. Chris Jericho taps out as he's spinning around taps out to the giant swing now you're either going to love that or you're going to hate that just like you're either going to be smart or you're going to be stupid <laughs> oh, come on it was awesome never seen it happen before chris jericho on twitter slamming anybody insulting him for this telling them you couldn't take one swing of this two swings of this you'd be crying to your mommy to save you and it makes sense Caprice Coleman, the best color commentator in the world right now, nobody's even close, points out throughout this show time and again how moves work, why they work, what's the psychology behind them, what's the, what's the athletics behind the moves. And he points out here that the swing isn't just about making you dizzy. It's about your muscles stretching out as this Swiss Superman swings you as hard and as fast as he can. The, the elongation of your muscles and as your limbs that are already sore and worn and some of them may be close to tearing after the moves you have to go through in a wrestling match are now just aching and throbbing as the blood rushes to your head, rushes to your fingertips, and you have nothing left. And it looked like Claudio Castagnoli was never going to stop swinging. He was going to swing until Chris Jericho's head fell off or something. And Chris Jericho literally couldn't take it anymore. And Claudio was shocked that he tapped out to it. But the rest of us weren't. The rest of us who watched this were thrilled. This was exciting. This was different. This was new. This was fresh. The things a lot of you pissants say that you want in wrestling. And when you get it, you got the balls and the nerve to complain about it. I appreciate you fans who love this kind of stuff. I appreciate you fans who know what wrestlers go through to entertain you, to give you fights that are done right. Wrestling done right. The name of the game, right, baby? And Claudio Castagnoli is given the Ring of Honor, that classic title with the big red ROH letters in the middle, holds it up triumphantly. He's so excited. Wheeler Yuta, another member of the Black Pool Combat Club runs out wearing his Ring of Honor Pure title to celebrate with his friend and faction member, Claudio Castagnoli. Great moment, incredible moment. Confetti falls from the ceilings and streamers hit the ring. It is the return of streamers. Wouldn't Terry ought to be excited? I don't think he was down there in Texas, but I could be wrong. The streamer guy. How many of you know that guy? He's wild. He's crazy. He's all about the streamers. And they're back in Ring of Honor, as is honor and decency as Claudio Castagnoli is your new Ring of Honor world champion. He does not have to join the Jericho Appreciation Society. It looks like that feud is over both Blackpool Combat Club and the JAS will move on to other things. Some of you have been calling for that for some time. Jerry Lynn, a Ring of Honor legend and Hall of Famer, comes out to the ring. He's excited to see the belt off of Chris Jericho, and he celebrates with Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Yuta. In the center of the ring as the crowd roars its approval for the new champion. I cannot wait to see where Ring of Honor goes from here. We already know that Tony Khan has announced that Honor Club has returned. I'm a member. You should be a member too. I'll be telling you more about that in a separate video. Um, that's where Ring of Honor weekly television shows are going to be seen for now. I'm sure the continue to look into trying to secure a network uh, but there's no reason if you love good professional wrestling great professional wrestling which is something ring of honor has always been that you shouldn't subscribe if you don't have enough money sorry about your luck i do i feel bad for you but if you have the cash there's no reason whatsoever as a wrestling fan as a ring of honor fan like i have been for over 20 damn years to not subscribe to this network to see the great content all the backlog including the ring of honor pay-per-views that happened since tony khan bought it and everyone before that going back many, many years. Ring of Honor television shows, Ring of Honor specials, Ring of Honor DVD specials, the Hall of Fame special. Tons of stuff on there that is wrestling done right, baby. Just like this show was. This was a 10 out of 10 show. I loved everything about it. There was nothing bad on this show. This was a show for wrestling fans. Oh, there, there could have been more build and why did you just rob? No, no. Take your complaints, shove them up your ass and go watch something else if that's what you want to do. If you love good, solid professional wrestling and you're a dedicated fan that has followed this stuff for your whole life, like I have since I was seven years old, 
this show was for you. No doubt about it. 10 out of 10. Perfect. Loved it. Thank you, Tony Khan. Thank you for watching. And I'll be back with another video before you know it.